Welcome everybody to this week's VVBGA webinar featuring Hans Estrin talking about considerations and lessons learned on root washing systems. Take it away, Hans. Thanks a lot, Vern. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to have you here. And uh, yeah, we're it is the season pulling roots out of the ground, uh, getting them going, uh, and we are diving into some of the considerations and lessons learned. You know, we've been um, uh, myself, Andy Chamberlain, Chris Callahan, this post harvest team. We've been out and around to many hundreds of growers and around the state and New England and seen lots of different systems and heard lots of different things. So this is a chance for us to uh, throw up some of these, um, some of the key lessons learned and some considerations. So here we go. And, and Andy is here and definitely many of these photos are his. All the good ones are his, you'll know. And uh, I think Chris Callahan has jumped on too and may add um, some stuff as well. Hey Hans, right. I just wanted to yep. remind people that they can put questions in the chat as we go here and that you'll answer them when you're done. That's right. And uh, is my sound okay? Everything sound all right? I could turn up the volume possibly. Um, does it sound all right? As far as yes. Okay. It's good. All right. Sounds good. Here we go. Okay. So yes, tis the season. There are a lot of um, you know often things are sort of come to a head and uh, many people are pulling a lot of roots out of the ground and need to process them quickly when they're in good condition. Um, and some people do go all winter, but uh, many don't. So a lot of systems have to be really dialed in and busy, busy harvest time of the year. Um, so we're today, what we're really gonna do is focus on what I'm calling the most important, some of the most important considerations that we really got to think about no matter what system, root system you're designing or putting in place. And then, um, you know, then actually looking at the systems. And that's the majority of what we're doing today is um, looking at a bunch of different systems from tiny, small, almost no cost to the largest ones we have in the state. And some of the lessons learned, and again, pipe up with discussions uh, with question or um, any kind of discussion topics. Uh, we're going to fly because there are a lot of photos. This is kind of like a whirlwind tour that we're all going to get here, and um, we'll go pretty quickly through a lot of them. Okay, so when any system, and in fact, a lot of post-harvest, almost anything post-harvest, these are real important considerations. First and foremost, flow, uh, good production flow. Everything's moving efficiently in straight lines. Uh, the things that product is touching are cleanable, durable contact surfaces, and we're talking about hygienic design here. Uh, that's a, is for every, everything that is in contact. Uh, the design and looking carefully at the products and how long they'll last is real important. Uh, easy access to everything. So you don't want to mess around with trying to find anything. Uh, you want to be able to see the product really well. This isn't rocket science but really important to keep all these four things in mind, ergonomics and creature comforts. You know, this is, um, there's no way you're gonna last long. Uh, any worker will washing roots um, in cold, wet conditions with, um, you know, bent over and lift in real heavy things. So, you know, we're, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this right now, but when we look at this good production flow, you'll see it in, in many of these photos. Um, it's not only the equipment, how it's laid out. Um, I don't know if you can see my, my uh, browser, my uh, arrow here, but it's also that things are moving uh, more or less in lines that don't backtrack. Uh, they're either taking news or um, going straight. And um, the quality, the product is, uh, to be efficient, the product has to be not dried up or have dirt dried on it, you know, clean, moist product that's easy to clean. And um, all these are real important when thinking about design, timing, placement, all of that. Hygienic design will 
definitely be looking at many of these photographs and there's a real oh i didn't post it but maybe in the chat andy or chris if you could post the um, link to the blog on hygienic design that would be great in the ag engineering so really five key principles we're looking at um you know visible reachable surfaces all of them they're all cleanable uh, there aren't collection points materials are compatible for what you're doing um, so it's you know, they're not materials that shouldn't be there or going to rot in time. Um, food safe and thinking about preventing contamination overall. Uh, these photos are from uh, the blog that I think Chris has put out the last couple of years. Um, and Chris, you're welcome to pipe in here, but um, just flying through it, you know, thinking about a, one of the big problems with materials is they're really hard to wash. This is a brush washer, I think, over on the left, this photo, and looking in at the kind of surface that you, you know, there's no way you're going to wash this stuff, never mind the bristles. Um, so being able to access stuff is important and, um, you know, doing, replacing um, hard to reach nuts with uh, sort of hand tighten things or a possibility or even quick release so you can get at and open up stuff and clean it. Uh, looking at carefully at all the materials, the welds, uh, anytime there's points, uh, there's harborage points for when anything overlaps for, uh, you know, moisture and biofilm and, and uh, bacteria, obviously. Welds are also important. We want to get not intermittent welds, but more uh, smooth, long, uh, long welds uh, are important. And um, yeah, the photo on the, the right is a uh, rinse conveyor if you haven't seen one, but they're, they've really been designed with you know, hygienic design in mind, easy to clean, easy to take apart, good materials. Uh, a lot of, you know, this is not a primary contact surface, this is barrel washer at, um, at um, Jericho Settlers, but, you know, just that keeping a, keeping a close eye at um, even the secondary points, sort of drains that come up means it's gonna be hard to dry this surface. Uh, materials can be kept and surfaces in good repair because certainly rust or corrosion is also har harbor points for contamination. Um, this is a clear scene. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anyone or someone want to pipe up? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, it's a, a key point of hygienic design is that, you know, you can't tell if something's clean unless you can see it and you can't clean it unless you can see it. So it, it really serves two purposes, just being able to have access and visibility of all your food contact services. That's kind of the key point. Great. Thanks. Okay, and that hygienic design, uh, Andy posted it, uh, a link to the blog post, which goes over this stuff in much more detail, a real excellent presentation. Here's an example of just, you know, light, you know, you might not think uh, this is really important, but, you know, here's a barrel washer. You see the light in that upper left corner. Uh, that's a, a halogen and the windows uh, being there as well. Really important for both, um, you know, efficient efficiency, getting things through, understanding, the, you know, where, when things are clean, quality control, all of that. So in the long run, it's going to be saving time and money and frustration. It's hard to work in a dark space. Ergonomics, creature comfort, you know, really it, it can't be underestimated taking care of yourself and your workers over the long haul so they can take care of the produce. And, you know, something might work for a while, but turnover, uh, you know, if you have some pretty difficult, um, long, cold, wet sessions that go on and on with bad ergonomics, and uh, those things can really contribute to turnover of crew. Um, not being invested, and then other things the crew's dealing with when they're in those kinds of situations tend to mushroom. So, you know, taking care of your crew, having them help you, you know, figure out what, what they need. Um, either you're going to be heating the space or you're going to have really good protective clothing. You know, cold and wet conditions can be miserable, as you all know, well worth the money. This is from um, uh, Route 5 Farm. Okay, so right equipment. We're going to jump in and spend the rest of the time really thinking about different kinds of uh, uh, root processing equipment, root washing. Not so much looking at um, some of the auxiliary stuff, uh, all the cleaning equipment, the dealing with sediments uh, and 
um, like uh, wash lines, conveyors, those kinds of things. Mostly looking at the barrel, uh, the actual equipment for washing. So it's really complicated. I don't think, you know, there's not one right thing to say or one piece of equipment that's right for all kinds of farms, obviously. But, um, you know, I think starting with your bottlenecks and constraints, uh, that's really important. You know, when it, what's the, what does it look like during the processing time? You know, how many workers do you have? What's the space look like? What's the temperature going to be like? Do you have good clothing? Uh, what, how fast do you need to crank things out? Uh, what's your unit type? What are you doing? I mean, you, is it bunched, bunch screens or loose screens? That obviously makes, it's a key decision and it may be mixed. So you might have, have multiple methods. Unit size uh, could be all over the place. Uh, some of the largest, I think the largest uh, root processor or washer in the state does small retail bags or a lot of them, uh, but there's, they do many of them. So, uh, it, you know, it does, it does make a difference obviously and packing wholesale bags, uh, you know, you need big batches or bigger batches to make it worth it with a lot of people to keep the flow good. So that all comes down to production rate and, and workers and just making things work well. We can't, I was, I was going to try to make a simple logic diagram and quickly realized it was impossible. Uh, but a couple of things that we can look at. So we're, we're looking at four major categories, I would say, of, of different root systems. So these spray systems, which are often tables, but they could be racks, they could be other things as well, buckets or baskets. Um, and mostly for one, you know, one person or could be more depending on the size of it, you know, 100, 200 pounds an hour, you'd be cranking. Um, and, but they're, you know, they're, it's good for retail and it is good for um, uh, when you have a few employees. Shrink this, hold on one second. There we go. Okay. Um, so, can't, yeah, so if you're holding a sprayer, that's a bad idea. You want your hands free. So that's, you know, one thing that is um, a design consideration. And certainly starting without that is fine, too. So a lot of bunches, it's good to think about some kind of hands free. Small batch barrels were in the more, you know, they can be expensive, five to $10,000 or but they could be less. Um, actually, this is for a will see. So certainly the small batch barrels uh, DYIs could be pretty inexpensive, but they they can crank out you know an, an order of magnitude more practically, um, but often you know more like two or three times more, uh, and batches could be bunched or loose. Sort of a keep your eyes on things. The bigger barrels obviously uh, can get huge, and some of the highest uh, production lines, ten thousand pounds per hour, I think is what Pete Screens can do with good product with their new system. Um, but they're generally up around a thousand pounds per hour and take a few people. The rinse conveyor is a nice, it, you know, a really versatile um, piece of equipment that, uh, you know, is semi pricey, but it is also very versatile and needs to be dialed in. We'll spend some time looking at that. Okay. So table systems, you know, when you look at the hygienic design, it the, probably the least expensive thing is these Galvi uh, fencing material on top of wood. And that's, you know, it's a lot of people use it. It's fine to get started, but I'll, but uh, definitely is going to have, it's going to be problematic cleaning over time and supporting it well, et cetera. They're pretty heavy. Um, also moving them around is difficult. Quality of products, pretty cool. So, I mean, pretty important, right? Letting things dry out too much. Um, it's going to take it's going to take a lot longer to clean product. Uh, this is at Footprint Farm, and you'll notice this rack underneath. Um, some of you might recognize that as a closet rack, which is true. The thing that goes up above. These are pretty inexpensive. Um, and Andy, maybe you could also post uh, the. You, Andy did a great blog on um, all these different kinds of materials, cost per square foot, etc. Uh, so we're just going to peek at a couple of them here. Already in the chat. You're awesome, Andy. So when you're thinking about really, you know, doing this in a more serious way, just it's worth investing. It's a small, small footprint of real estate, um, investing in uh, some kind of surface that's 
more smooth and cleanable. This is a slight upgrade, obviously. This is um, extruded metal, I believe. This um, and more cleanable, more durable, um, and um, but it does also have wood underneath, and it's on. It's not so easy to adjust, and that's at Joe's Brook Farm. These uh, plastic racks are pretty inexpensive, can be moved around, but usually they need to be modified ergonomically and also often with spray backs, et cetera. So that just depends on how you're washing things, what your systems are like. So this is returning to this closet rack here at um, Footprint Farm, because they do a lot of retail and a lot of bunches. Uh, and they're doing dunking, but um, they end up also, also using these racks uh, both to spray outside, but you can also dunk bunches and spray them at the same time. Uh, so it's a pretty versatile system. And of course, there, it's also hung right nearby. So this gets that sort of the light, everything, easy access, uh, good material. The ergonomics of this are, you know, can be adjusted. This leaning over the rack could be a downside, uh, but it works pretty well. So hands-free, how do you get there? And, um, you know, typical hose, it's difficult to think about how to have some kind of foot pedal or something to turn this on. Um, so a lot of people have gone, this is Jamie um, uh, Gildrian. Um, is his first name? I'm forgetting. I haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> Gildrian Farm. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he doesn't have the foot pedal, but he definitely got the hands-free part. And this is a fairly easy solution, sort of garage sale desk lamp. Um, arm or some kind of an arm that you can mount something on and just keep it on a low flow and work product that way. Uh, it's fast but uses a fair bit of water. Here's a crazy homestead design from, of course, from Portland, Oregon. Where else? Kelly Wood, who's a homesteader. I just saw this um, on on the internet. Not great hygienic design, right? With this carpet mat, can't really been cleaned. I mean, you could disinfect it probably in a tub or something but it does hook up to a hose and there's little spray nozzles across the top. And so this is a constant spray and has the ability to crank uh, the produce bunches back up at the same time to get underneath them. Um, I don't have any good photos of this, but if you go online uh, to and, and look at this um, bunch watcher from Sister Hills Farm, it's great, a great video kind of showing how this, this setup works. And this is really a Cadillac. They've taken, you know, durable, good, high pressure motors in a bucket, um, height adjustment, um, and, and this uh, three-way sprayer um, under sort of high, high pressure, but a light flow and a pedal. And this thing costs about a thousand bucks uh, for to be put together and can move about, you know, twice the speed as a normal um, sprayer and a third of the water. So into small batch barrel washers, and again, we move up both in cost um, and what can come out of them. The five to 10,000 grand, you know, that, that price point is for these Wilsies, and many of you have seen them, uh, and they're, you know, they're, the good part about them is they've got a really high quality parts, stainless barrel that lasts forever, they're reliable, they contain sediment, um, and they aren't that cheap, obviously. And this is from um, um, <clears throat> this is from parts in um, at a Nora, Nora Lake up in uh, Hanover, near Hanover area, Portland. Okay, so yeah, adjustable. These motors are. Actually, I'm not sure. This is yeah, that's showing the motor there. Um, if you are, you know, there's a lot of folks that like to experiment and or don't have a lot of money. And so there's a lot of good options uh, for these smaller barrel washers. And this is a great example because it's also from footprint. You'll notice these closet racks in the background and they often are mostly doing bunches through the season. But then this time of year, all of a sudden, you know, they've got a few tons of, of carrots and other roots coming in and they've got to do larger batches. So they set this up and, you know, they're, again, mostly retail, but the seasonal crunch and they have got young bodies in good shape and like to bicycle. So they've done some pretty cool things. A lot of people have done stuff like that. Um, and in fact, 
you know, you don't even really, I mean, a lot of people use motors, but I have seen um, either bicycles or this is from um, um, Shintali Farm in Mansfield, Connecticut, Ed Weiser. And this is a, you know, it's a nice setup with bicycle rims um, and a home built kind of pusher and, and a bread basket. And then, um, you know, he's not, there's no motor. You don't see a motor, but he does have the water set up. There's no real angle um, per se. I think it's a one, one batch wash and he's basically turning it by hand, but it looks like it works well and then pulls it out. So larger batch washers, um, you know, key points we'll get into, but they can, you know, from 600, probably usually 600 to 1200 pounds per hour is kind of what you're looking at. 2000 would be a bare, bare bones. You could build them yourself for probably a thousand and um, they can get pretty expensive. I think 20 grand was the, the Polish model that Pete's Greens just got, but they sunk at least 80 into their line. Um, so again, good for pulling out large amounts of stuff. So pretty simple design often. The, it's, it is key to get, go for smaller spaces here. This is a prototype built by Robert Haddad from Cornell. Um, and uh, keeping these at uh, more like an eighth of an inch, I think rather than, or you know, quarter to an eighth rather than any bigger, uh, will keep small carrots or things from getting stuck. Having a clean, something that's easily cleanable is important and having brushes and curved brushes are the best uh, that can, can clean this out. A lot of people put various pieces of things in there to help the carrots tumble and um, there are potentially ways to do that that are easier to clean. All right, you have a bar with holes drilled um, every uh, frequently to spray the water with. Uh, wrong way. So some of the key lessons learned, uh, and I've talked to a lot of growers and seen different things. This, you know, adjustability, durable uh, surfaces, those are some of the key things and sediment and water management. So making it ergonomic, being able to adjust because the rounder, right, rounder roots are going to roll really easily. Uh, but carrots will have a hard time going through. So if you're going to try to get a uh, product through the barrel washer, either you need a slope or you need to push it through, and the slope has to be adjusted for the type of vegetable. So in this, this case, you'll see um, both of these have different kinds of adjustability, right? This, in this case, uh, on the left, we've got Last Resort Farm with, with uh, four by four posts that they could just increase and crank up the thing. And here um, with at Golden Russet Farm, uh, they have cinder blocks that they can move around. Neither of these are like really slick, but they're all there. And if you look at this last resort, you know, the, this uh, sprayer is at one height, which can be just fine. Um, this, many people have gone with this other kind of sprayer arm, which can be adjusted potentially um, as needed. Um, I'm not sure that it ever gets adjusted, but that maybe is a, a good option. Um, and motors, uh, I don't have a lot of info on motors. Chris, you might be able to answer some questions on that if we have them. Okay, what's the difference between these two? So if you're looking sort of, they're both sort of similar uh, barrels made from wood, right? Wood is not really cleanable or sterilizable. But um, Vern says one has carrots in it. He's very astute. <laughs> uh, but wood can be washed, and you'll see these, right? These are relatively clean with a scrub brush, and um, they, can, they can work really well. This one on the left from Last Resort is as a typical uh, PVC uh, spray hose. This one um, on the right from my boot is not. There's no sprayer. Uh, and what that means, uh, and Andy was telling me, I think this is a flat unit, so it's it's well designed, the dump, uh, right, so it's been cut, it's been scribed, so carrots don't fall through, all that's good. Uh, they sort of hang out there because it's, they're um, not, um, they're not moving along and they're sprayed uh, from this end. Okay, I guess some pictures here. 
there's pulling pulling it through, but there's no angle on this thing. And the spray, uh, I guess it's getting sprayed from the either one side or the other with the hose. Pressure spray hose. And I think that's Andy's um, camera there, is my guess. <laughs> So that's an interesting system. I'm not sure how it works, but uh, they're, you know, they're running it, turning it. Uh, let's look at a couple really dialed in ones and we're getting towards the end here and I'll turn it over to Andy soon. Um, you've seen this picture before, but I wanna return to it because it's got like all these things, um, uh, all these things are sort of dialed in. And, and Andy's saying it's made with one by four boards. Oh, actually, yeah, I wanted to um, point that out. The, this is a, a, a good setup for, um, you notice these one by four boards that are inset. Uh, these are even smaller perhaps. Anyways, it's a, it's a tumbler, they're tumbler boards, but they're set in such a way that they're easier to clean. There, uh, there's a less, there's gonna be build up in these crevices, cracks here, but generally speaking, you could scrub in uh, and clean that out pretty well. So Hans. Yeah. I would just say that a lot of folks have moved to making those tumbler bars um removable as well more easily removable just getting back to the hygienic design piece so instead of using deck screws think about through bolting with wing nuts or something like that mm -hmm. so that you can take those off more easily thanks chris okay so this is putting a lot of these things together that we're talking about this good good lighting they it's actually four seasons so they're they're warm they can operate in the you know in, in modest clothing uh, Angle adjustments, are, they're all switch controlled, both the angle and the water. And um, uh, Robert, who's their the, the, um, son here, he's uh, gotten into a lot of this stuff and has done a great job for them. So this is a, on a little winch, which is switch controlled. And uh, for the angle and water is also controlled from the, um, the, the right end here where the packing and sorting happens. So yeah, we got big, good sediment catching that's going on here, sediment and water uh, down into the drain. And then this um, packing sorting area, which is rimmed and washable. And then um, the good ergonomic design with the uh, bins right to the side. And they actually just made an improvement by having extra bins right under the table. I don't have a picture of that. So here's this in, in action. Hey Hans, did yeah. you mention did you mention the hose reel? Uh, no, but we should go, go back a picture or two. Mm -hmm. So right there, see the the red hose? Mm -hmm. That's on a retractable reel as well, which is a kind of a getting back to creature comforts. That's a super nice little detail. That that hose is on a ratchet reel, so it, you pull it down to use it. When you're done using it, it goes up into the hose reel, and uh, we have. Andy and I put together a reference on hoses and hose reels as well. That's great. Andy, maybe you could uh, post that in the chat. So this is just to see it in action. It's going pretty quick. <laughs> okay, here's another dialed in Cadillac from uh, Route 5 Farm. And uh, we'll just look at a few things right there outside, but uh, good aprons, good quality aprons. And I'm gonna you can put in the chat, I've got some arrows here, this is now a test. So maybe just throw in the chat some of the things you're seeing and the arrows maybe are, are, are little cheaters, um, hints of uh, some of these real efficiency things that they've done. And I haven't seen anything in the chat yet. Maybe I can't. Uh, this is the inside. Let's see. No, I'm not seeing too much chat here. Well, you got all the answers right. <laughs> uh, you know, on wheels, things can be moved really easily. Good um, sediment management with a, on a slab and crushed stone. Height adjustments easy. Ergonomic uh, height adjustable height for the uh, the, the dumping um, dumping bins. 
and also on this side for packing and sorting. And then we have bag, a bag packer over here on the right side as well. Um, adjustable bars here and hoses uh, more or less off the ground or out of the way outside. Good attention to detail. These guys do a great job. The bin dumper is nicely scribed in there. Okay, a couple large volume lines. I don't want to spend too much time on this because there, there's way too much. But um, you know, if you're into mechanical harvesting, you're putting out thousands of pounds, and you've got you know large, large volume, high stress. Uh, again, uh, having bigger barrels and um, you know, hygienic design here is you know moving away from wood uh, to semi-washable things. We still have a lot of problems here with the tumblers. Again, what Chris is saying is it'd be great if these could be easily removed with either some kind of a quick release or hand release from the outside. So cleaning could happen. This is at Jericho Settlers Farm. Oops, backwards. Um, so a lot of a lot of mechanical harvesting, you know, it's a tr there's a trade-off. So you're picking up a lot more sediment and a lot more seconds. Um, Krista was saying that you know, in a bin that weighs 800 pounds, she's getting 550 pounds of number ones, and then about two or 300 pounds of um, two, you know, 200 pounds of seconds or babies, and then um, a couple hundred pounds of sediment. So it's quite a lot. So how do you deal with that? This is the underside of, we've seen the top side of this, it was kind of rusted, but being able to drain um, drain these things uh, underneath, it's important. Cleaning, again, look, you know, careful attention to detail, difficult to get into here, but um, cleanable, right? You can get in there with a brush and detergent and scrub that thing pretty well. High pressure nozzles uh, are often better if you're, you know, if you could, you can dial in the pressure um, differently. And adjustable height as well. This isn't ideal, but um, it works for them. And they're, of course, dumping um, this is that same picture we've seen before. There's a brush that they use for cleaning. Um, and they've got a bin dumper and a conveyor lift as well. So big, big system they're doing. Um, you know, again, it's uh, about 1,200 pounds, 1,000 pounds an hour. But that's sorted and washed, so they're, you know, in bag. They're doing everything in this line. And recently, they got a um, rinse conveyor as well. It again, versatile piece of equipment. It does a lot of different things. Like they're running the uh, carrots uh, through this barrel. Um, I haven't seen this, but Andy was saying that they also often will finish them uh, through the rinse conveyor because it's so easy. All right. So peat screens, and then turn it over to Andy to look at rinse conveyors. Uh, they're, you know, probably in terms of production rate, well, I think the highest in Vermont, or at least that I've heard. This is their old uh, barrel washer, and I actually don't know where this thing came from, but uh, I've seen this in action. The, one of the main problems that they had with the mechanical harvester and high clay soils is that just dealing with all the sediment they're inside and um, boy you walk in there and, and it's like you're in you're in some sort of a, a mud pit um, so you know that this is a, a higher volume system obviously probably moving up another couple thousand pounds or a ton or two per hour and um, conveyors bin dump as well uh, Um, so this requires a lot of people for, you know, it's probably four, four people on this line, never mind people cleaning up and there's a lot of packing, uh, that's going on. And these guys are working in a pretty cool environment over many hours, um, and just keeping things clean and good flow is, is their major job. So recently, I guess last year, Pete got a upgraded unit and this is a recycled water unit and it has a rock um, a de rocker on it which is this whole front section there's a whole another section that's taking 
taking the, a lot of the sediment and the rocks out. And this is, um, it's hard to see this, but um, if you, on the left-hand picture, there's like a black bag that's <laughs> over a huge pipe. And uh, that's, that's where the sediment can be blasted out of there. And you see all the stones and rocks and mud and the shovel sitting there. And they're taking out at least um, two, 300 pounds of sediment per bin and you know, putting it back in bins and then bringing it out onto the field again. So it's a whole nother system. Um, to just deal with that mechanical harvester, but boy, they can harvest carrots quickly. Uh, you know, at, at least a 10 time increase in, in harvesting rate. And they're running, you know, on a good day without too many seconds. Pete was saying that 10,000 pounds are going through here per hour. So that's, you know, 10 times more than <laughs> a normal barrel washer uh, under good conditions. And there's a lot of cleanup though, and a lot of sorting. Um, so there are other things that are going on here. Okay, um, so I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Maybe just pause for a second. If anyone has questions, I know we're, you know, we're into this. A lot of there are a lot of photos, a lot of stuff coming. So we'll pause for a second before Andy can take over here. Uh, Hans, I don't have the slides, so you'll have to run the run the presentation, and I can chat to him. Yep. Okay. I mean, you could also, we could do a little switch over, but I'm happy to run it. Um, you can just tell me when to, oh, share. Look at that. <clears throat> Did you, are you able yep. to share? All right, so you can drive and I'll get out of here. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I can drive. You're, you're the one sharing, but uh, I can chat to it. So um, this is the AZS Rinse Conveyor. Uh, it's a, a fun tool that has been around on the market for a little bit. Um, and I got a good tour of it a couple years ago from Dave Pock at Sassafras Creek Farm down in Maryland. Uh, that's where these photos came from. He was the first one that we heard that had it. Um, so we were able to check it out and it, it works in a couple different ways. It's got three different stages. And stage one is the low pressure, high volume rinse. So that's, think of it like a shower head. Uh, stage two has high pressure spinning nozzles. Uh, think about that as like pressure washer nozzles, but on a spinner bar, like a dishwasher. Uh, and then finally, it's got a low pressure spray bar at the end. Uh, that would be more like a Mr. Irrigation head sort of thing. Uh, at the very end. So that just kind of mists the final rinse before the product comes out. And this all goes on a chain conveyor um, bare belt. So it's got a couple different pumps, um, takes quite a bit of water usage. That first stage uses recirculated water. So it's like a, a big tank on the bottom. Um, and that just keeps the, keeps the water flowing to really get the bulk of the, the mud off. And then uh, the high pressure stage two and three are both freshwater inlets uh, to make sure the crops are nice and clean coming out onto the sorting table. Next slide, Hans. There we go. Uh, so it's held down by a rubber strap, and uh, that allows the unit to, to pop up. So you can open it like a hood, uh, as seen here. And this allows you to easily clean out that recirculation tank. And... Um, yeah, it lifts on gas cylinders, uh, much like the the trunk of a car, and it it um, can be easily opened and closed for for clean out, which is just phenomenal. So many, so so much equipment is not designed to do that. Uh, a couple of features is it has a, a roll off brush on the end of it to help guide the the product off the belt onto the onto the sorting table. Um, and this is an accessory inlet shelf where you can set a crate down uh, in order to load the product onto. Some people just stack up crates, others have a table or another conveyor leading up to it. Underneath that inlet, there is a, a pan there which can direct water or dripping mud down into the recirculation tank. But if you remove that pan, uh, if you're dumping a crate of really dirty stuff, some of that bulk sand and water or sand and mud and dirt is just going to go right to the floor and not muddy up that recirculation tank. So that's like a special little added feature there. 
that just shows, yeah, taking out that tray. Hans, did you include uh, this whole slide deck? Probably. Um, so this just shows the back. I'm, I'm going to go yes. through this. Sorry, I okay. was. Uh, th this is a full slide deck talking about the the whole um, machine. I I will do a little bit slower paced recording of this at another time uh, for those who have the machine. That's really what this is oriented for those who have the machine, how it works. So I'm just going to fly over it as a, as a quick overview for those who've never heard of the thing. Uh, so this is just a backside of the machine and, and the clean out ports. Next slide. Uh, there's the power cords, 30 amp, 220 volt, um, much like a, a welder or heavy equipment would be. There's a fresh water inlet side on the on the outlet. Uh, it's the, the control panel right up there on the front, easy to access all the controls. Uh, it's got belt speed, uh, start stop switch, mode switch, so you can control whether you want just the first stage, uh, just the second stage or all three running at the same time. Uh, you can easily drain out the tank uh, just to pull the valve on the lower side. It's got a tie down points uh, for shipping from Pennsylvania and an adjustable foot to level your space if you don't have a perfect floor. Uh, the spinner arms and the rinse arms are uh, adjustable, like you, like we were talking about. So it's a toolless design, so you can just spin that wing nut with your hand to move the sprayer bar either closer or further to the the product you're washing. That's a shot inside showing the low pressure stage one. Uh, quote, shower head style, much like the barrel washers. They they have holes drilled in the bottom. And um, it works great as a hydro cooler, as well as a rinse conveyor or a crate washer. And so a lot of people are using this to wash crates as well. This is the uh, low pressure pump um, for that first stage. Yeah, keep going, Hans. That's the high pressure pump for the second stage, and it's got a pressure regulator there, which we show on the next slide. So there's the pressure regulator where you can dial it in because whether you're washing something like zucchini with a soft skin or something like carrots that can really take some more pressure, uh, you can you can dial it up. Um, those settings, there's a lot of there's a lot of dialing in uh, to figure out which um, which pressure works best for which crops because you don't necessarily want to skin your zucchini. <laughs> um, but if you've got really heavy clay, it makes sense to, uh, to hit it with a little more pressure. This is just, um, like I said, this is a heavily detailed PowerPoint here. So it uh, goes into the details of maintenance tips and things like this oil sight glass on the pump. It's got float valves to control the pumps. Um, and make sure it, it never runs dry or overheats. Keep going. Just showing an inside float valve. Adjustable tensioners, keep going. Uh, there's a shot of the, the high pressure spinner bars. Um, and some models have two spinner bars. So this is an option that's super helpful if you're doing a lot of bunched crops. So you can turn one side on and keep the other side off. For example, bunched carrots. You can give a high pressure spray to the root end, but not completely destroy the greens end. So that's a nice, um, nice feature. That's the controller valve mounted right on the side of the machine. Those are the low pressure nozzles for that final rinse or the third stage. It's got access doors to access. There's spray bars underneath the machine as well. So it, the crop gets hit from both sides and that's uh, an access port for that. That's looking inside the access port. So that's what you can, you can get to. Just a shot of the, the belt. 
Uh, when it ships, it ships with RV antifreeze. And if you've got any other accessories like wheels, those are uh, inside the tank as well. Uh, that's one of the filters in the tank to, to pull out any sediment, rootlets and things that could get caught so it keeps it from getting into the, into the pumps. Shows the pump inlets port. Um, you can, you might have to set up the the spacing of the little bit exit shelf there. So that just shows uh, the adjustment points to that. Uh, we'll skip through this, Hans. These are these are really details that uh, users might need to know, but um, most most don't need at this point. So. So key points like winterizing it before winter and, and making sure there's no water in it to, to freeze up is important. So this machine out of the crate is like $7,000. Um, it takes about two to three people to run. Uh, you probably want to add in things like a sorting table at the end here at a minimum. Um, bigger farms like Jericho Settlers, uh, work with AZS to produce a whole wash line, which includes the soak tank to the barrel washer, to the rinse conveyor, to a sorting table or to sizers. Um, so you can kind of build it out as your farm grows. So it seems that, you know, relative to a barrel washer, this thing isn't necessarily a ton faster, but it's super versatile and very cleanable. Uh, would that be an accurate statement. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I see Tim, you know, Timothy, you're here. Um, and I'm wondering if you're thinking about or what your situation is with, um, you know, sweet potatoes right now. And if you're washing them and what you're thinking about, I don't know if you're there and want to pipe in. Just give you a second. And if not, we'll move on. Right, maybe actually gone at this point. Uh, all right, so thank you, uh, Andy. That's that's great, and we are actually don't have a lot of time. And I was hoping we'd have either some discussion or questions. Um, here's some more more photos of uh, carrots coming out of the rinse conveyor sorting table. These are all Andy's photos i believe right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and if anybody's considering one of these uh or or have one and would would like to talk about it or share their throughputs or anything they've learned uh i would i'd love to hear it and and chat with you so feel free to send me an email and if you're inquiring one uh either reach out or browse browse our blog i'll post that in the show notes as well um because we've got videos and fact sheets and a couple user reviews on the rinse conveyor itself. Um, just jumping back to the barrel washers, most of those wooden barrel washers uh, we were talking about earlier were the grindstone farm kits. Uh, they're just under $3,000 and they're quite accessible, pretty easy to put together and um, work for a lot, of, a lot of the small farms in our region. Hey Andy, you yeah. want to talk real quickly a little bit about the the user group idea that we we kicked off around the rinse conveyors just to uh, give people an idea what's going on there. Yeah, so we've discovered that uh, there are quite a few users of the rinse conveyor out there. It's a quite unique tool, and like I said, it's it takes quite a bit of setup, and there's some nuance to it. And part of the challenge is the manufacturer uh, is in an Amish community, so he's not necessarily online and as flexible in communicating all of this. So we helped pull together uh, a user group call last spring, right before uh, the shutdown where I, I was in person with them and we got on a Zoom call and chatted with different users and made a bunch of notes about things that other growers would like to see improved uh, and ideas that uh, the manufacturer had to make it better as well to, to highlight some of that. And, that's where this presentation and um, 
that I just skimmed through kind of came from. And I I will do a much more slower paced in depth uh, discussion of that, which which I'll share at a later time. Uh, putting all that together for those who have the machine or or just ordered a machine uh, to help them understand how to get it set up and and how to dial it in. So there is further work in the background going on about uh, user reviews and, and case studies and uh, working as a as a team. Yeah, it's burn. I know that brushes can be hard to clean, so I was just wondering about that one brush that offloads the produce. That's a good question. Um, in short, it isn't necessarily needed, but it is part of the machine just to help ease the product off the belt. Um, the manufacturer's thinking was that even though brushes are hard to clean, and, and this machine really kind of replaces the traditional brush washer, is that oh, at that point, all the crops are clean. And so the brush really isn't going to get very dirty because it's on the exit side of the machine. So that was kind of the the thought process there. And I think those that have the machine could um, probably echo that uh, that isn't necessarily uh, a dirty point, but correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, this is Tim, it, at least it's easy to access compared to the brushes of a brush washer. True. There's no region in there. So Tim, do you have uh, a rinse conveyor? Yes, and it ends up being that the uh, barrel washer is too, uh, too rough on sweet potatoes. So the, uh, the rinse conveyor is what um, uh, is gentle enough and adjustable enough for the different types of soil. Great. So that's been working for you? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. You know, when, I first, when we first got it, we weren't sure of how fast it would go. Mm -hmm. um, but we can uh you know two people can we're you know we're washing about 900 to a thousand pounds an hour right so and that's comparable to the root washer that you had that was damaging the crop uh, we actually switched to from a uh a brush washer to the rinse conveyor and the rin the brush washer took well, it was like a longer system. It had the dunk tank and uh, an infeed belt and, you know, all this other stuff. And um, and that took, it actually was much longer. So the, the rinse conveyor is faster. That's great. Who else do we have here? Just other questions, you know, that come up. Um... Hey, Tim. Uh, I, I think it'd be worth you discussing a little bit about your adventures with um, bin dumpers. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we got away from we got away from using a bin dumper, uh, you know, because because the you know they created more problems than they uh, than they solved um, the you know all the effort of. You know, had a bin dumper into a dunk tank. I guess the the bin dumpers worked well. It took up a lot of room, uh, but you needed for them to work well. You had to have a soft landing for them to go into. And so the dunk tank, the dunk tank, was the the real problem. Where um, cleaning that thing is just it, it is, you know, it, it's really where there's a time suck, uh, and and finding all the potatoes that some float, some sink, and uh, and then making sure you had them all out of there. It was uh, uh, it was it would end up you were messing around with it a lot more than um, because we were kind of looking to automation uh, for it to really go well, but we could never crack that nut. And what are you using now? Uh, it ends up that we are unloading bins by hand uh, on the end of a small electric forklift to adjust for height. And uh, one thing we did with our rinse conveyor, you know, this wasn't really planned out, but uh, we, the rinse conveyor comes with like a two foot in feed on, on the, on the in feed side of the rinse conveyor, it's yeah, about two feet. Well, we had asked them to make ours custom and, and make it four feet. Uh, and so uh and so we're able to like actually 
uh, comfortably load, unload a bin by hand onto that. And that ends up being, you know, I, you know, the end, you know, we're talking about whole farm systems and, and, you know, I need someone in the barn with me. I was kind of going to just, uh, I was thinking it was just going to be me washing, but then, um, I was trying to, the bin dumper was really trying to figure out how I can do this all by myself, but a second person to help move bins around and, and work the farm ended up being, uh, the the answer yeah and and it, we were just worried about it being ergonomic and uh, we figured out an ergonomic way to unload the bins uh and that's the forklift and the right height and the length of the and the length of the infeed belt got it was that easy working with them to do that modification with um an easy s the two um uh, four foot instead of two foot uh yes it was it was you know they were reluctant to do it but it's worked out really well so great all right well i think we're almost out of time here i'd love it if any anyone else had any comments or questions uh this might be the last few moments and um before we wrap up for today Okay, well, I will, hearing, hearing nothing, I will uh, move ahead and just, you know, like the, we're, we're working to gather all of this together in a, in a all, uh, all this, all the types of equipment, different uh, costs and benefits and getting them together in organized places. Uh, so keep, you know, keep coming up with questions and shooting stuff our way and um, we'll see if we can pull it together in ways that are usable for everyone and uh, have a, Great rest of your day, everyone. And if there's nothing else, we'll end things. Yep. Let's say thank you so much, Hans. And this will be posted on the PVBGA webinar site. And join us next week for presentation on steaming high tunnels to control chickweed. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Fern. <laughs>